So Patrick Newman, as I mentioned earlier, is truly an economic historian, which uh, for those of you who listen to the Human Action Podcast might know that we have been going through the two-volume uh, Rothbard, an Austrian perspective on the history of economic thought. We did four shows on it. It's two huge volumes, over 500 pages each. And it really is a lost art. It really is a tradition in America uh, that is in deep, deep trouble. And I'm told by a lot of PhD economists, it's actually possible to go through an entire PhD program now in economics and, and learn nothing about the history of your own field. And so we have these young, brilliant people who might go to Wharton or Harvard or Stanford, and we're dropping them into investment banks, and we're dropping them into places like the Fed, and they literally don't know anything. You know, maybe, maybe uh, economics started with Adam Smith. That might be all they know. They know nothing about their own profession and its own history. And so Patrick Newman is a welcome addition uh, to this genre, and a needed addition to this genre. And he's going to be speaking tonight about his new book, Cronyism in America, uh, in the early colonial period, which is 1607. To 1607 to 1849. Uh, when he's done, he will take a few questions. So please welcome Dr. Patrick Newman. Thank you, everyone, for attending and, 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 staying, and staying this long. Uh, now would be a great time to go to the bathroom or to check your phone or to do anything, <laughs> anything of that nature. Uh, so for the, those of you who don't know me, who haven't met me, I am Patrick Newman. Uh, I, I live in Florida. I live in Tampa. I'm a stone's throw away from uh, St. Pete. And it's, a, it's, my, it's my great honor to be giving this talk uh, tonight, uh, to be talking about my book, Cronyism, Liberty Versus Power in Early America, uh, 1607 to 1849. Uh, it's, it's, it's really an honor. This is, this is something I've been working on for a long time, uh, which we'll be talking about. It's kind of so you have you have your baby. Some people have actual babies. I have I have a book. That's that's my baby. You know, and it's like this is my book. This is this is something I've, I've created. Uh, it's taken it's taken um, it's taken many months. It's taken years to to, to write, and uh, it's just it's, it's it's an incredible honor to 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 have spent all this time on this, and now I'm I'm selling it uh, as uh, we're, we're selling it as a as a paperweight. Uh, so. <laughs> Um, no, but in all seriousness, it's a book. It's, it's meant to be read. Uh, so I'd like to talk a little bit about uh, the, the origins of the book. How, how, did, how did this book come to be? You know, where, where, did, the, where did the book come from? Uh, in the fall of 2018, uh, Hunter Lewis, uh, who is a, uh, a donor of the Institute, um, he's unfortunately not here today, uh, tonight, but he, he approached me after the Supporters Summit and he, he asked if I'd be interested in writing a book on the history of crony capitalism in America. Uh, this was after I'd worked on the Progressive Era. I edited the Progressive Era by Murray Rothbard, came out in 2017. I was currently working on editing the fifth volume of Rothbard's Conceived in Liberty. And I, I, I said, well, crony capitalism, someone wants me to write a book on crony capitalism. Uh, of course, I immediately, I leapt at the opportunity. I was very interested in, in doing this. I, I said, well, I'm currently editing the fifth volume of Rothbard's book. I can start working on this uh, next year. So about April of 2019, I started to work on the book. That's when I officially started to work on the book. And I I really just, both guns blazing. I, I, I was working uh, a lot on this. I was reading, I was writing. Um, I was trying to cover an incredible amount of material. And I had uh, basically finished the book uh, in about, let's just say, December of 2020. And then the Mises Institute, I was publishing it. I worked on the index over the summer, and then the book is out. And I'm just uh, incredibly happy to, to have this book uh, completed. So as I mentioned, the book is on cronyism or crony capitalism. What exactly does that mean? All right, so traditionally, we are, uh, we're told that you know, legislation is in the public interest. So it's to benefit the public welfare. You have central banking to eliminate business cycles and to, to iron out the fluctuations of the economy. Tariffs protect jobs. Subsidies are wise government investments. Infrastructure subsidies, I'm sure many of us have been hearing this. Uh, quite a bit in the news. Uh, this is all very important. It's all this is all noble. These wise, enlightened, public-interested uh, you know, uh, in, uh, you know, uh, officials. They're they're all uh, pushing for these uh, policies. In reality, uh, it's due to special interests. It's due to insider businesses, politicians, intellectuals looking to get uh, concentrated privileges at the expense of the public. 
Okay, central banking does not stabilize the economy. Central banking benefits Wall Street bankers, and it uh, basically leads to, it causes business cycles. Okay, protective tariffs do not protect workers. Okay, they privilege uh, certain manufacturing businesses and create monopolies and cause higher prices uh, at the expense of consumers and uh, foreign firm firms. Okay, so I wanted to focus on the uh, really what I was supposed to be focusing on was the history of cronyism, why it went up in certain eras, why it declined, so why special li pri privileges increased during certain years, why special privileges didn't increase as much in other years. And originally the book was supposed to be about a 500 page uh, comprehensive history, right? And as I spent more time on this, uh, projects, they, they evolve, uh, you, you change your focus a little bit, or you say you want to concentrate on, on one topic uh, a little bit more than other topics. And, and I guess you could say in classic Rothbardian fashion, I said that, well, uh, in order to accurately describe cronyism, I, I really wanted to concentrate initially on early America. Because early America, uh, the time of the founding fathers, really up until the Civil War, you had significant political movements that were actually interested in reducing cronyism, right? Nowadays, we're lucky if we have a politician speaking at a podium like this, and they're going to use the word free market in a speech like this. We get all excited. We're like, wow, they said free market. Like, dude, does he actually believe in the free market, or is he just saying this? Like, what's, what's going on? You know, back then, you actually had politicians who believed in the free market, and even better than that, they were pushing for policies uh, that actually promoted the free market or tried to bring about a quasi-free market, right? So you have... Uh, Andrew Jackson uh, as president, he vetoed the recharter bill for the second bank of the United States, okay? Uh, we could only dream of a president uh, standing up to a central banking institute uh, like Andrew Jackson and his fellow Jacksonians, All right? All right? So <laughs> we can only dream of having a founding father like Patrick Henry, who's really able to fight the centralization in the U.S. Constitution in the creation of an empire of power. Patrick Henry is my favorite founding father. I swear it has nothing to do with the fact that his name is Patrick, as, as my name is Patrick, right? So as I was spending more time researching, I decided to really build upon something that Rothbard had uh, focused on a lot in Conceived in Liberty in the Progressive Era, which is this eternal struggle between the forces of liberty and the forces of power, right? Because back in early American history, you actually had a significant a political force a composed of business, businessmen, politicians, intellectuals, et cetera, that were genuinely interested in bringing about free markets, decentralization, peace, private property, and personal liberty, so to speak. You know, the good, the good, the, 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 the real hardcore libertarians, okay? You had the anti federalists, you had the Jeffersonian Republicans, you had the Jacksonian Democrats, right? And when they had control of the government, Cronyism declined. It didn't decline as much as we would have liked due to what I call the corrupting nature of power, but it still declined, right? We'll take our victories uh, when we can get them, right? They were fighting the forces of power, so the forces of statism, of greater uh, government control, of centralization. So I'm talking about the Federalists. Uh, I'm talking about the Hamiltonians, the Alexander Hamilton, uh, Alexander Hamilton, uh, and his in his, uh, in his uh, uh, coterie, you could say, uh, talking about the National Republicans, the Whigs, et cetera. And when they had control of the government, power, uh, power uh, and cronyism increased. Okay, so special uh, interest legislation increased. Okay, so I wanted to focus on this, this battle between liberty and power. And if you've read any of uh, Rothbard's works, his historical works, such as the Progressive Era or uh, the Four New Liberty, Right? He talks about this, 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 this early American history going through the clashes between the, Hamil uh, the Hamiltonians and the Jeffersonians, uh, clashing between the Democrats and the Whigs. He talks about this in the span of, let's say, five pages in Four New Liberty, in the, the revised edition. So I said, well, wow, this is a great story. I, I was really uh, captivated by this. Let me use this as the framework for my book on cronyism. And this is what you're supposed to do as intellectuals in the Austrian tradition. You're supposed to try and stand on the shoulders of giants and not make too big of a contribution, but just make some sort of contribution, right? So later on, someone can look at your work and say, well, I want to expand upon them. This is how science evolves. This is how ideas evolve, right? So I said, well, I wanted to write a book focusing on this period of American history because I think, as I'll be talking about, 
in, in, in my discussion, there's, 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 there's a lot of these individuals such as Thomas Jefferson and Andrew Jackson, I don't know if you know, but they're not exactly held in high regard now. Uh, you, you see their statues, uh, there, there's spray paint on them, or they've been, uh, they've been, they've been erased from, from buildings and so on. Uh, it's, 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 it's a sad time to be uh, someone who loves American history because there's a complete sort of uh, revision uh, take, taking a hold uh, on all levels of, of, our, of our American history, especially at the uh, K through 12 level, all right? So I, I, this, this, this is something that I, I wanted to write on. Uh, I had I had written this book, and it's 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 a great honor to to have this book published and to now be be able to talk about it. Right. So I said to myself, okay, we have to you know I'm gonna gonna give this talk. I thought, okay, do I want to describe the book? Do I want to tell you what the book's about? I mean, I've, I've just, just told you it's about the history of cronyism. It's about this great struggle between liberty versus power. I could you know, go through the whole plot of the book, tell you about the book, et cetera. But then I said to myself, well, wait a second. If I do that, then no one's going to want to buy the book right? or read the book. I, I, I got I to only describe so much just so you say, well, that was a pretty mediocre job of explaining the plot. I guess I really do need to read the book in order to figure out uh, what he's saying. So I said to myself, well, I, I'm, I'm pretty good at doing that. Uh, I, 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 I think I can describe, uh, I, I, can, I, I can do that task quite well. What I'd like to talk about, so I've, I've got a book called Cronyism. It covers the period 1607 to 1849. All right, and I'm asking people in the year 2021 to read the book. So why should someone in 2021 or 2022 or uh, through the rest of the 2020s, et cetera, read this book? All right. Another way of putting this is why should someone in 2021 buy this book? Another way of putting it is, why should someone in their friends in 2021 buy this book, right? So what is, what is, the, what is the importance of this book? Why should people care about this book? So I, I thought about this, of course, after I wrote the book. I'm like, oh, why are people going to, well, people have to find it. You know, why, why do people want to uh, read this book, right? So the first reason as to why this book is important and why other books uh, such a, you know, on similar topics are important is that history is how we learn. Right. History is how we learn about um, the world around us. This is something that Rothbard wrote uh, in a lot of grant, uh, grant proposals uh, to, to write on American history, which eventually became his Conceived in Liberty series. And this is something that really stuck, at, stuck out at me. Because you have an economist, and he said, look, people, most people find economics fairly dry and boring. It's abstract. Some people are really captivated by it. Other people, it's, 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 it's tough, right? How most people learn is they'll, they'll learn uh, through history. They will, they will you know, take a history course uh, when they're in elementary school, then they'll take another history course in uh, high school, then they might take something in uh, college, and then they will watch a documentary every now and then, or they're going to read some articles, read a book, uh, go, you know, watch the news, et cetera. History is how we learn about various economic concepts, et cetera. And unfortunately, most people are learning the wrong history, right? Because when most people go through history, uh, history class uh, today on American history, they're going to learn that the Industrial Revolution was bad, so the emergence of capitalism was bad. They're going to learn that uh, capitalism caused the Great Depression, uh, et cetera, et cetera, right? Because one of the reasons why I would say the left or really just the forces of statism and, and government intervention are so successful now is because they've totally monopolized the, the history market, right? At every stage, they've totally monopolized the history market, uh, whether it's in elementary school, uh, you learn basically a very anti-free market perspective on American history, uh, whether it's in college, whether it's on the news, whether it's a documentary on the History Channel, et cetera. So your average person is going to say, okay, well, of course we need government regulations uh, during COVID to keep us safe because without health regulations, people were poisoning the, uh, uh, the sausages. That's why we had this Meat Inspection Act, right? Or of course we need the Federal Reserve to pump in reserves uh, and to increase the money supply and to stimulate the economy during an economic downturn. Well, that didn't, when, when the Fed didn't do that, we had the Great Depression, right? So your average person even though they might not consider themselves a historian or really consider themselves very knowledgeable in history, they, over the successive years, they've sort of been, these ideas have really been packed into, into their mind. And so they're stuck with a certain perspective. Because if we want to change people's perspectives on the present, we have to change their perspective on the past. They're linked. 
Okay, if we want to, if we want to get people to support greater free markets, uh, less government, we want to get people to, to, to be against central banking, against protective tariffs, against government spending, against the national debt, we have to show uh, that all of these things were bad in the past. Otherwise, people are just going to say, well, I learned in my history class, or wait, someone told me this, et cetera, okay? We need as many examples as the free market and the quasi-free market showing how private roads or private banking systems exist. This is something my book does. I go through this. We need as many examples as we can showing that pr prominent legislation in the past was not due to uh, benev benevolent politicians trying to advance the public interest. It was due to cronies, right? It was due to individuals trying to enrich themselves at the expense of the taxpayer. Okay, my book goes through this as well. Right. If we don't change people's perspectives of the past, unfortunately, we're not going to win. It's just going to be, this is the, this is the sad reality because the, uh, the, the, basically the anti-free market forces have control of the history market, and it's going to continue to shape people's perspective on how uh, we, we change the, uh, the present. Okay, so history, it's very important. Okay, it's how we learn. All right, that's the first reason. The second reason uh, why uh, I think my book is important is that it's interesting. I, I think it's interesting. <laughs> and if I think it's interesting, then I mean, it, it must be interesting, OK? <laughs> so it's interesting, right? I go, through <laughs> I go through a lot of examples of cronies in pushing for special interest legislation, a lot of stuff that your average person doesn't really know, or even your average historian, someone who's read a lot of books on American history doesn't really know. because. I didn't really know a lot of this stuff when I started. And I said, wow, that's incredible. That really happened for that reason, right? So I talk about how Robert Morris, the merchant prince of, uh, of Philadelphia, was prominent in uh, basically trying, during the Revolutionary War, was trying to install a big government uh, basically to benefit himself and other elites through the Articles of Confederation. And he tried to do the same thing through the Constitution. I talk about how George Washington was actually very close to vetoing the bill for the Bank of the United States. He was actually going to listen to Jefferson and not Hamilton. But why he didn't was because the Federalists would let him change, uh, amend what was known as the Residence Act to place the Capitol, which was supposed to be somewhere on the Potomac, uh, just a, a little bit closer to his land holdings in Alexandria. This is a true story. He signed the bill so the Federalists uh, would allow him to basically put the Capitol right next to his, uh, his land. And his real, the, the value of his real estate shot up, you know, obviously, like 1,000%. Okay, Most people don't know that. Most people don't know. That's why I, I, this may come as a surprise, but Washington, D.C. Has, has been crony from the start. So uh, you know, ho hopefully you're not too shocked by that. I talk about how the Boston Associates, this group of elite manufacturing firms, were not only very prominent in pushing for protectionist legislation in the 1820s, but they were actually crucial in getting uh, Florida into the union. And that in the treaty that where we purchased uh, Florida from Spain, they were able to get a very lucrative bailout that benefited their, uh, their manufacturing companies and their shipping companies. Okay? I talk about how the reason why we uh, declared war on Mexico during the Mexican War in the 1840s was not to spread slavery. Okay? It was actually to capture uh, ports on the western coast, particularly San Francisco. Right? Because then when we had uh, 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 cities on the western coast, we could start to uh, engage in various imperialistic policies with China. This is actually the reason why uh, we started the Mexican War. And this is something that all of uh, James K. Polk's cabinet officials uh, admitted. So there's a lot of examples like this. Another example is that Chief Justice John Marshall, okay, he was a prominent land speculator. He was very affiliated with Robert Morris. His daughter, uh, excuse me, his younger brother, James Marshall, actually married Robert Morris's daughter. Stuff that you don't really read about in your average American history book. Stuff that makes you go, hmm, all right, I want to spend a little bit more time thinking, you know, looking into that, right? So there's a lot of interesting examples of cronyism, a lot of interesting examples of uh, genuine libertarian radicals trying to reduce cronyism. Right? And that's very important. That's, 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 a, that's an important reason uh, why people should read the book. Right? It's interesting. And when it's interesting, then it's enjoyable to read. Right? So, so far, we've got history. Right? It's how we learn. We have the book's interesting. Okay? What's another reason why uh, this book is important? Is that, well, there's currently a revision going on in American history. There's the 1619 Project. 
There is critical race theory. I don't know if many of you know this, but there's a, there's a gubernatorial election going on in Virginia right now, or at least it's going to be going on in a couple of weeks. This is sort of a uh, big in the news. And a, and a big, a big uh, issue between the Republicans and the Democrats is over what is being taught in the public school system in Virginia, particularly how we teach American history. Right. Because nowadays, with the 1619 Project and critical race theory, et cetera, we learn that America it was all doom and gloom. Everything was just this, this plot uh, to, to, to in install and strengthen slavery. America was racist. It was sexist. It was all these bad ists. It was, and it was all capitalism's fault. So now you've got uh, people saying that the history of capitalism is, is built off of slavery and that all of these prominent politicians, guys such as Thomas Jefferson, oh, when they were supporting free markets, it was all just this cover-up for slavery. That, that's all it was. And now we need to tear down all these statues or we need to uh, describe history through a different lens, right? Well, my book doesn't do that. My book goes through history as I believe it should be taught and is the correct way that it should be taught, early American history. Is it the way that is, uh, you know, uh, fits with our you know, current ethics? You know, were these people, uh, would we say they're, they're ethically good from, from today's standards? Well, of course not, right? But that doesn't mean we change our interpretive lens on how we understand these individuals. We want to understand their strengths and weaknesses from how people back then understood their strengths and weaknesses, okay? I don't want to demonize someone now just because I don't think what they did back then uh, was socially acceptable. You want to demonize someone if people back then think uh, thought what they did was socially acceptable. Um, uh, unacceptable, okay? So there's this, 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 this very big revision going on in American history and particularly how it's being taught. And people are learning that American history uh, is all doom and gloom and that there's, there, there, there's no heroes, it's all villains and that uh, capitalism has led to all sorts of problems. And, and what we really need is a, 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 a thorough uh, remaking of how we view history and as well as a thorough remaking of how we view the present world. Okay, so my book, I, for people who are just interested in, in the old school American history, whether they're uh, you know, older individuals, whether they're their parents, whether they're you know, they, 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 they're, they're, they're children, they're young adults, et cetera, having that sort of old school American history, uh, I think is very important right now. It's, it's, it's missing in traditional uh, his, you know, history textbooks and just traditional history books, what you, what you watch on the news, what you, uh, what you read online on various articles, et cetera. I want someone who's going to look at the strengths and weaknesses of a Thomas Jefferson or an Andrew Jackson in not a biased light. Okay, I want someone who's going to uh, respect these individuals for the tremendous amount of uh, effort they put into to trying to uh, create uh, what was known as an empire of liberty. Okay, so that's the third reason, right? So we've got so far we've got three reasons, right? We've got history, it's how we learn, the book's interesting, right? Stop the 1619 project, and what's the what's the fourth reason? The last reason. Well, I want to show that there's there, there's there's light at the end of the tunnel. Unfortunately, there's no light right here, but you know there's still if you read the book there's still there's still light at the end of the tunnel, right? Because when we're trying to change the world right now, we think that, well, it's, there, there's, there, there, there's no hope, right? The forces of power have won. The forces of big government have won, et cetera. How could we possibly try and change uh, the world of uh, today? Well, I think if we want to try and change the world of today, we have to understand and appreciate how similar uh, movements such as ours changed the world in the past, right? And they were fairly successful. Were they perfect? No, did they get everything they wanted done? Obviously not, but they still got a, a, a good amount of stuff done. The Jacksonian Democrats still got rid of the Central Bank of the United States. They still got rid of protective tariffs. Yeah, we, got, we all got to give them a, a round of applause. Exactly. I mean, how often uh, can, we, can we say that a president actually stood up to a central bank, right? That's, that's very important. Uh, how often can we say that a president actually paid down the national debt? These, are very, these, these things are very important. If we want to try to achieve something like that, even a fraction of that in the present, we have to learn how people did that in the past. Okay? So there were these mass movements uh, of, of libertarians and, and forces for decentralization and small government. Okay? They were very radical. They were very ideological. They used a variety of resistance tactics, nullification, sometimes even threatening secession, et cetera. They were very strategic in how they tried to accomplish their aims, okay? So the anti-federalists 
fought the Constitution in the 1780s, but once they realized that the Constitution had been created, they switched their tactics. They became very vocal defenders of the Constitution, or at least they created what's known as the strict constructionist view of the Constitution, interpreting it the way they wanted. Okay, Patrick Henry was very uh, prominent in this, right? So the Constitution, uh, that at least can be defended by many libertarians, that interpretation actually came from people who previously fought the Constitution, okay? The, 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 uh, the, the, the Jacksonians, they had previously fought executive power uh, in the 1810s and 1820s, but then when Andrew Jackson became president, they championed executive power. Why? Because they realized that Congress is too corrupt. You had to have the executive do the work, uh, do most of the heavy lifting, and veto various bills, and rotate out uh, various bureaucrats in the government uh, to try and drain the swamp, so to speak. Okay. So we want to we want to see that well we, we were able to make uh, achieve successes in the past so well, why can't we achieve similar successes uh, in 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 the future okay why can't we do the same thing right now so at least that fourth reason that there, there there's light at the end of the tunnel okay uh, people have made strides in the past maybe they didn't get as far as they wanted to or it didn't work out in the end but you know we can do it one more time and we can do it with feeling okay so that's 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 an important reason why. Uh, the book should be read. I, I go through a lot of these, uh, the, this, this hidden sort of story. So we've got the four reasons why I think the, the book is important for someone in the 2020s. History, it's how we learn. It, the book's interesting, okay? We want to stop current uh, revisionist takes on American history, right? And uh, we want to show that there's light at the end of the tunnel, okay? So, <laughs> so I'm very... Uh, <laughs> So I'm very honored to finally see this book out in print. I'm very honored to see it in physical form. I hope that uh, for those of you who have who've purchased it uh, and, and, and read it, I hope that you enjoy it. I hope that my talk has, has maybe changed some of, some of uh, the other people's minds to, to, take, to take a look at the book, to, to read it, to see, to see if it will change your mind or to see if it will change someone else's mind in your life. I would once again like to thank Hunter Lewis for sponsoring the book. I would also like to thank the Mises Institute for graciously publishing the book. All right. It's organizations such as the Mises Institute, these are organizations that I've, I've really grown up loving. My very first Mises Institute event was a, uh, a Mises uh, Circle event in, in New York in 2010. I'll never forget it. I went there. I picked up my name tag. I met Pat Barnett. Uh, and I, I said, wow, this is, this is a great organization. My first Mises University was in 2011, and here I am promoting my own book. So I think that's pretty cool. I'm very happy about that. I would like to end with a, a, a quote of sorts, right? Uh, so it's actually a quote by Thomas Jefferson. Well, it's technically a misquote. Uh, he didn't actually say this, but a lot of people said he said this. Uh, it's that, <laughs> so, well, we're just going to say that he said it, right? Um, it's that... Eternal vigilance is the price of liberty. All right, we now have computer programs that uh, we can churn through all sorts of documents. Apparently, Thomas Jefferson never said it. it that saying originated around that this time. Andrew Jackson did say something like that in one of his uh, um, uh, presidential speeches, but this is something that's generally attributed to Thomas Jefferson. And so eternal vigilance is the price of liberty. What does that mean? Well, it means if you want to protect liberty, if you want to cherish liberty, if you want to defend liberty, you constantly have to be learning about liberty. You constantly have to be reading about liberty. You have to be writing about liberty. You have to be talking about liberty, right? Because if you don't have people like that, the other side will just win, right? It's just what's going to happen because there's going to be misguided government policies. There's going to be various uh, special interests trying to get their own legislation, and they're just success successively going to win, right? So you need to be eternally vigilant in order to uh, protect liberty, right? So in that spirit, what I'd like to say is that Eternal research is the price of liberty. <laughs> okay, so in order to protect the liberty, you have to have people researching about liberty, reading about liberty, writing about liberty, constantly trying to defend liberty against its various critics, right? Because if we don't support people like that, then liberty won't survive. And it's thanks to the, uh, the, the organizations such as the Mises Institute that have really been instrumental not only in my uh, career, but is also in many other uh, individuals' careers who are here right now, that has been truly dedicated uh, to defending liberty. 
So I think with that, I would like to conclude. And uh, we have some time for some questions. So thank you very much. Patrick, we have, we have a couple of mics in the room. Please, if you, if you would, just raise your hand, wait until the mic comes to you, and ask your brief question for Dr. Newman. Dr. Newman? Yeah. Um, is, your, do you, is, it your, is it your opinion that cronyism today, the kinds of cronyism we're facing with Pfizer and all of the COVID stuff, is that unprecedented? Are we in an unprecedented time of cronyist turmoil, or is there a precedent to that that you know, we can look to to say there's a way out of this? Uh, that's a great question. Over the past couple of years, really since the, the 2020 crisis, we've seen a uh, tremendous increase in cronyism. I would say a lot of this has been unprecedented, but we've seen similar explosions in cronyism, particularly during uh, various national emergencies, such as the Civil War, World War I, World War II, okay? And you've seen tremendous, uh, during those periods, tremendous suppressions of uh, personal liberty, increases in various special uh, uh, privileges to businesses and intellectuals and politicians and so on. Uh, after those, um, those episodes, cronyism declined a, a, a little bit. Uh, it declined noticeably more back in the day, but it's been increasingly declining less and less after each successive crisis. Uh, but we have been in similar periods. Of course, history never repeats, it always rhymes. Uh, but I do think there is a way out of it. Uh, I do think that people are finally starting to get upset at the various restrictions. They're starting to get upset at the economic situation. The job market isn't uh, recovering uh, like people wanted to. Inflation is now becoming a problem. I'm very interested to see uh, how that's turning out. The Fed, has, at least, is somewhat thrown in the towel. They've switched from calling in fled, uh, excuse me, they, they switched from calling inflation transitory to now the word is, is episodic. Right, so it's it's like Star Wars episodes. It's a new inflation. The inflation strikes back. Return of the inflation. The inflation menace. Attack of the inflation. Revenge of the inflation. That's what we're moving to now. Uh, <laughs> right. But I think I think there is a way. Uh, there there is a, there there is, there is a way out. Yeah. So we have other questions. Can I can I talk now? Is that okay? We enjoyed your press release. I mean, your talk. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> but a question that, that uh, here I am, oh, sorry. that folks like me lie awake at night and think about is, and this should be in your wheelhouse, and if you don't have the answer, then I don't respect you. I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> is why, 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 why? after the Bank of the United States Charter had expired in 1812, did Madison and the legislature sign off on renewing the charter for a new Bank of the United States in 1816? Yeah. Why would they do that when they knew that the institution was controlled and owned by private banking stockholders and had nothing to do with the benefits or the welfare of the people of the United States? Why would they do it again? Yeah, yeah. What were so they thinking? Yeah, that, that, that's a great question. So the, 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 first, uh, the first bank of the United States, its, it's charter uh, relapsed. Uh, it was not renewed in 1811. This was due to the tie-breaking vote by uh, George Clinton, the former anti-federalist governor of New York. He became vice president. It's no relation. Uh, when, I, when I say Clint, Clinton's, of, Clinton's of New York. And then the bank, a new bank was chartered in 1816. So why would they do that? Well, the unfortunate reason is that, as I discussed in my book, there was various prominent financiers that had lobbied uh, for this bank of the, the, an, another bank of the United States, particularly John Jacob Astor and Stephen Gerard, right? They had lobbied for a bank. Even more importantly, they had lobbied to have their former uh, lawyer, Alexander J. Dallas, become Secretary of the Treasury. <laughs> <laughs> and so they were all pushing for this bank because they had bought a bunch of government bonds uh, during the War of 1812. And they were looking uh, to trade in these government bonds for stock in the Bank of the United States at par value, which dr drastically increased their holdings. I have admittedly a, a negative view on Madison. So I think he, he basically kind of went a, a, along with all of this because he was okay with it. By this time, the, uh, the Republican Party 
Uh, the Jeffersonians had become thoroughly Hamiltonian and, and uh, very Federalist, but that was, that was why they pushed for it. They didn't have the courage to get rid of the bank. Uh, Jefferson didn't have the courage to get rid of the bank when he was president, but fortunately, that charter uh, was not, uh, did, did, did not go throughout its entire length, uh, thanks to Andrew Jackson basically vetoing the early recharter by Nicholas Biddle. But so to answer your question, why we had another central bank? Well, we had prominent cronies basically lobbying for it. So that's, that's the unfortunate but correct answer. Yeah. yeah. Um, we bought the book, so let me say that right up front. Right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You can ask your question then. Now. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. You know, talking about George Washington and buying the land and all these different, and when we constantly like to defend the founding fathers, is this going to be fodder for, you know, liberals to say, we told you so? Yeah, yeah. The the comp the country was a mistake in the beginning. It's always been corrupt, and it's time for the the do over. I haven't read the book, and maybe you explain all that. But as you're talking, that that thought came into my head, and it's bothering me. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank yeah. you. Yeah, so it's a it's it's an important question. You know, will people now say that well, this is they they were all corrupt back then? I would like to say, well, well, some of them are corrupt. In particular, the, the founding fathers that are now champion the most now are the ones who are the most corrupt, right? So you have a musical for Alexander Hamilton. This is interestingly the same man. This is not even discussed at all in the musical, but this is something that I discussed. He had become the most powerful general. Uh, in the late 1790s, he'd become inspector general, basically in charge of the army, and he was trying to uh, get the United States to declare war on uh, France so we could invade Louisiana, we could even invade South America, et cetera. Stuff that isn't even talked about now, right? Because people just say, oh, Hamilton, he's great. He, he supported a central bank, right? So there were definitely bad people back then. There were cronies. But very importantly, there were also good guys people who aren't even discussed at all, right? So if Washington was the most famous Virginian in the 1790s, well, there was also the second most famous Virginian in the 1790s. A lot of people don't know who this was, even the second most famous American, and that was Patrick Henry, right? So there were good guys. And guys like Patrick Henry, they did fight the Constitution from the beginning. And I do think the Constitution was a mistake because it tried to basically centralize the, uh, the, the, basically the, well, the, the 13 states and put it into a centralized government, when in reality, the correct approach was to have multiple confederacies. And this is something that Thomas Jefferson wanted. This was his empire of liberty. Right. He wanted um, he thought it'd be OK to have multiple confederacies. He even thought that the West Coast would eventually become its own independent nation. Right. And this is the story that I think needs to be told, because one of the important ways how we can change the present is actually through trying to support greater decentralization, such as nullification or even the dreaded, uh, as Tom Wood says, the dreaded S word, you know, secession. Right. Uh, these are the, the appropriate strategies that we need to pursue. Right. I think there's a couple. Oh, over there. Yeah. Hey, uh, thank you so much for your talk. Congratulations on your new book. One of my question, or my question is, uh, given the fact that you've done such an extensive review of the cronyism of the past, can you maybe give us just one example or one idea of maybe a strategy that we can apply today, given kind of the, the theme of the uh, talk this weekend? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. So that that's a uh, that that's a great question. Uh, relates to that fourth point I mentioned, uh, light at the end of the uh, tunnel. Well, um, all right, now this is when I quickly leave. Uh, but uh, <laughs> I think an important sort of strategy uh, that, we can, that we can learn from, and this is something that I uh, was, was, deeply impressed, uh, was deeply impressed by, was, again, how we can uh, strategically look at documents such as the Constitution and see what are the appropriate ways in which we can enact reforms on the, on the federal state or local level, right? So one of the great strategies that was uh, created in by basically anti-federalists, particularly uh, an individual, a Virginian, another great Virginian known as uh, it was John Taylor of Caroline, uh, was, was what became the compact theory, right? So arguing that the states entered the Constitution as a compact, and when, when uh, the federal government violates uh, uh, their end of the bargain, so to speak, states have a right to resist, to nullify, or potentially even to secede. I think getting more and more people comfortable with these ideas is very, very important because we're unfortunately not going to be able to reform Washington. It just simply won't happen. 
Uh, it's too it's too concentrated. The only way we can try and do uh, we can really try and enact reforms is if we try and do it much more on the state and local level. And we've really seen a lot of strides uh, towards nullification regarding various mask mandates or ordinances or vaccine requirements, et cetera. And this has gotten people a lot more states' rights oriented. You know, now people are like, "Oh, you're from Florida? Yes, I am. I'm from Florida. I'm from the land of Florida." I'm I, I'm a I'm a I'm a Tampanian. We, we we enjoy our freedom, and it's like how goes up uh, how how goes up in the, the land of, of of Pennsylvania? Like, well, what's going on there? Tell us about that, right? And that's that's I think that's actually healthy because we're we've been getting much more of a decentralized and individualist spirit, and this is something that's uh, that's very important, right? Hey. Uh, my question is, um, what would you say to the Richard Wolf types of the world who would say that there is no distinction between, they don't recognize the distinction between cronyism and capitalism, and he would, his critique would be that wherever you see capitalism, there always has been cronyism that followed behind it. Yeah. So <laughs> at my college, at a, a Florida Southern College, uh, we actually, Center for Free Enterprise, and uh, is sort of part of the uh, the, 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 the clashing battles. We, uh, we, we, had, we, had to, we had to invite Richard Wolf to speak. Uh, so I met him, and I, I've actually discussed some of these issues with him. And un unfortunately, I wasn't able to get my, uh, my, my point across. But, um, you know, so someone such as Richard Wolf, a very prominent Marxist, uh, who basically says everything in capitalism is bad, and now is talking about how inflation is due to greedy uh, capitalists exploiting the, the public. So, of course, we know what's coming, and that's price controls, uh, which this time it will work. I'm convinced uh, that, that, that price controls will work this time. This is the one time in history, but, but they will work. Uh, I, I will say that one, you, they just simply don't know their history. They don't simply understand how there were various quasi-free market um, uh, you know, uh, regulatory environments, right? So when people think of free banking in the United States, they think it was uh, very chaotic. Uh, in reality, the problems were caused due to, were due to government intervention, but it was by far the best monetary system that we've had in terms of bank failures and uh, the, the severity of business cycles, et cetera. Uh, so to explain that, well, um, you know, uh, these weren't due to uh, the capitalism's fault, this was due to cronyism's fault, and to also explain the importance of, of economic education. This is something that Mises said, that in really to defend capitalism, it's eternal vigilance is the price of liberty. To defend capitalism, you need people who are able to defend it against cronyism, right? The cronyism doesn't result from capitalism. The cronyism results from government intervention. Because whenever, business, whenever government starts to regulate and oversee business more and more, they're inevitably going to invite business into that partnership, so to speak. So this is the problem most people don't uh, understand. They just think, well, if we get the right guy in charge, we get the right person, they're going to have the right rules, and they're going to they're, they're be able to safely regulate everything and, and, and et cetera, et cetera. And, and the only way to combat that is through reason. It's through argumentation. It's through showing them historically uh, this is now what resulted, and it will certainly not uh, uh, result in the present. Yeah. Um, you said wonderful things about uh, Jefferson and his idea of confederacies and uh, nullification, so forth. But are those things in the book? Uh, yes, yes, I talk about them significantly regarding the Empire of Liberty, regarding the Kentucky and Virginia resolutions, regarding what was known as the Spirit of 1798 or the Spirit of 98, uh, regarding uh, the Compact Theory and etc. All of this is in the book because it relates to cronyism and it's how reformers genuinely did make. Uh, a, a very serious dent in cronyism using these doctrines, and hopefully uh, we can do the same thing. I'm confident that we can do the same thing in the present. Yeah. We were talking about the, uh, the, the position that some people take, which is just, we need to get the right guy in charge. But in, in your view, is, is cronyist domination of the political system inevitable, or is it, is it containable? And if it's inevitable, then is that ultimately an argument against the state or against any state. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, I, I would say it's, 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 it's unfortunately inevitable, but it's really inevitable whenever you have a very large country, you have a country that's, that's expanding, right? And that's putting more power in the central government. So the, the proximate reason, I, I described this in, in my book, um, I didn't want to give it away, but the, you know, it relates to the question that the approximate reason why the Jeffersonian Republicans and the Jacksonian Democrats failed, at least uh, they didn't succeed in, in fully uh, removing cronyism, was because they basically got corrupted by land. 
Jefferson's presidency, particularly his second term, was destroyed by his prior decision in 1803 to unconstitutionally, at least in his mind, purchase Louisiana. And this is this massive acquisition of land, because once you do that, then you have to support internal improvements, building all sorts of roads, et cetera, um, to bind the empire together. Jefferson, once he purchased uh, Louisiana, he then basically tried to maneuver, maneuver to acquire Canada. And this is really the reason behind the War of 1812. The Jacksonians uh, stumbled because over the Texas annexation question, as well as uh, trying to uh, acquire ports on the, uh, on the uh, California uh, coast, such as San Francisco, which led to the Mexican War. So really, the, the cronyism is inevitable uh, whenever we, we, we try and have these very large governments, like the central government of the United States, cronyism is inevitable because you have so many special interests and you're trying to, everyone's trying to get their own slice of the pie. Really, the only way I think we can realistically try to reform the situation is by through greater decentralization and at least trying to remove that power from Washington, right? So to have sort of limited, uh, like smaller governments where the people are thoroughly imbibed with sort of this, this general free market or libertarian orientation, right? That's really the only way we can uh, stop cronyism, I think. Yeah, how much do you trust left-wing politicians who claim that they want to take steps against cronyism and lobbying people like Bernie Sanders? Mm. Oh, uh, not not much, unfortunately. Uh, that's that's not the, the 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 correct solution because in many times, as sometimes gets covered up, they 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 are funded by various large. Uh, financial banks and other institutions, so they're 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 crony in themselves, and it's it's the uh, it's 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 the um, it's the it's the it's the the government is 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 Mr. Fix It. That's the mentality. It's the Nirvana fallacy. So it's saying the the market's not perfect. So there's various errors, and of course the market isn't perfect. Entrepreneurs make mistakes, etc. And they say so. Therefore, there's a government solution. And if you just listen to me, I will be able to bring about the promised land, etc. Uh, it's it's not a sincere. Uh, you know, attack on cronyism, we can look at various uh, socialist countries, not Scandinavia, they're not actually socialist. We look at the socialist countries that we would, huh, we would turn into places like Venezuela, et cetera. You know, they're, they're socialist, but they're very, they're very crony. So uh, the left-wing politicians, no, I would not trust them uh, to reduce uh, special interest, you know, uh, privileges and, and so on. Uh, we can very clearly see that uh, with all of the, the landmark legislation that you know, they, they've passed, if you think of all the cronyism involved in Obamacare or the Dodd-Frank Act, both of those in 2010, uh, it's, 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 it's an incredible amount. People are generally less uh, aware of this because they just simply say, well, these guys say they're fighting for the common man, the common person, so that means they must be. And, well, you know, I'm, politicians never lie, uh, so therefore, you know, they're doing the right thing, but that's just simply, that's simply false. And I think it's a very important goal of ours, a task of ours, to actually try to really change people's mind on this, that uh, politicians lie. Uh, this is a stat happened historically, and they will continue to lie, and they'll continue to take advantage of a relatively uninformed public. Yeah. Has there been a connection, oh, sorry, has there been a connection, historically speaking, um, and perhaps in your book, between the infrastructure that is, initi is initiated with the um, war and national defense, mm -hmm. and then maybe any cronyism that follows domestically? Yeah, yeah, oh, so that, that, that's, a, that's a great question. Uh, there's been a lot of infrastructure that's been uh, tagged along with, with, um, with, with war. In, in, in my book, uh, I talk about the, the Erie Canal. So if any of you are up, uh, if you had to sing this old song when you're in, in, in music class in elementary school about the Erie Canal, you know what I'm talking about, the canal in New York. That was actually very linked with the War of 1812 because uh, it was really pushed for by this uh, former Federalist, his name was Peter B. Porter, uh, and he was trying to get a canal, it was particularly a canal to Lake Ontario, because that's where his business was, and he thought that we've invade Canada, uh, we would be able to basically accomplish that. And it was, it was basically tied in, it later became the, 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 the Erie Canal, but I go through this whole story a lot of people uh, don't understand. I talk about how in the Mexican War, there was this big movement for a transcontinental railroad, or to try and have a canal across Panama, stuff that uh, the Transcontinental Railroad, especially during the Civil War. There's a war and infrastructure has, has, has been very, very linked. And a lot of people think, oh, infrastructure, well, 
roads and, 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 and you know, uh, canals. Right? People aren't talking about canals now, but we still talk about roads and highways. Well, there can't be anything crony there. You know, we, we, all, we all need roads. You know, uh, who would build the roads, so to speak? But actually, you look at the historical record, there's tons of pork. There's tons of special interest uh, privileges in various uh, uh, infrastructure legislation. So it's, it's not something that's new. The current cronyism involved in the infrastructure bill is not new. It's been present in basically every infrastructure bill we've had, unfortunately. Yeah. Hello. So this is sort of a general decentralization kind of question, but it's come up a lot in libertarian circles that I am in and uh, people with whom I respect, but there seems to be sort of this question about uh, whether like state governors can usurp the authority of local governors, even though they're in a libertarian direction, like uh, mask mandates and stuff like that, whether or not they should uh, supersede uh, these local governments who may constitutionally have more authority, uh, but whether libertarians should support these kind of uh, uh, and to me, instinctively, they should, but uh, whether or not uh, sort of state governors who may not have constitutional authority can can actually uh, move us in a more libertarian direction mm -hmm. uh, with local ordinances and stuff like that, whether or not we should say, oh, no, that's giving them too much power or whether we should support those things regardless if they're in a libertarian direction. Does that make sense? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. No, this is, this is very prominent, especially uh, regarding, say, uh, the state of Florida and various local ordinances. So if you say, well, if the people locally decided they want to do something, well, then, you know, why can't uh, we respect them and et cetera? And I would say, well, certainly if, they, if, if local people want to do that, then, yeah, we should let them do that. But local people didn't decide to do that. It wasn't a local decision. It was something at the federal level. See, the current, the critics of that, they never, it, 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 it's, it's not a one-way street. So they say, well, local, uh, you know, local, ta you know, uh, communities, towns, et cetera, they have a, a right to institute these ordinances and defy their governor, et cetera. But of course, if the governor's supporting restrictions and the local community decides to say, we know we don't want to restrict that, the, the, they, they never defend that, right? It's only in the direction of government intervention, right? So they say, well, we, you know, it, it's, it's always the local community's right to decide they want these ordinances ordinances or not. They, they don't actually mean that because when local communities have tried to resist, they go, they fall back on the authority of the state or the, uh, the federal government. So I do support uh, state, uh, state governments uh, basically saying, no, you're not allowed to do that, or no, you can't enforce uh, vaccine requirements or mask mandates or, or something else, et cetera, because it's not, it's the, 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 the other side isn't playing fair on that. And the local community doesn't have the right to do that anyway, because it's not a collective decision. Local communities, you know, local businesses have the right to say, oh, uh, you know, you sh if you want to enter my uh, business, you have to wear a mask or something. But they also have the right to say, if you want to enter my business, like, you don't have to wear a mask, right? It was never, it was never that way. It was always in the direction of more government intervention. So the people supporting these policies, they're not actually in favor of, of decentralization and, and local control. They're just in favor of basically greater control from, uh, from Washington. This is just a giant sort of smokescreen for that. All right, I think we have time for one more question. Hopefully that's an easy one. So the book st uh, stops at 1849. Yeah. Why 1849? And are you planning a second book to cover the rest of cronyism? <laughs> <Yeah. history? laughs> so, uh, that's, that's, that's a good question. Why did, why, did, why did the book stop at 1849? Well, the book stopped at 1849 because that was sort of the official collapse of, you could say, the Jacksonian movement. And I felt that that was a sufficient ending point for talking about the liberty versus power had gone through the Jeffersonian, had gone through the anti-federalists, excuse me, had gone through the Jeffersonians, gone through the Jacksonians. I felt that was a natural uh, stopping point. And yes, I would like to write a book uh, or books continuing the story uh, using a different interpretive framework. I'd, uh, you know, great sort of uh, period would be from the 1850s uh, to the 1950s, basically covering all of the cronyism in there. And uh, that would be a project that's something I'm, 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 I'm working on. If, if, if there's demand, I'd, I'd like to, I, I'll, I'll supply. Uh, so, as, you know, uh, uh, those, those John Baptiste say says supply creates its own demand. So, you know, there, there is that. But that's the reason why it was a good thematic sort of conclusion. And I would definitely like to continue the story. 
So thank you. All right, so I think we're, we're good? Thanks. Nice. All right, well, a big round of applause for Patrick. Thanks so much. Thank you. We'll see you in the morning, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you so much for coming. Right.